that, the state would call Deputy Shelby Eggers. <laughs> Morning. morning. Will you state your name, please? Shelby Eggers. And will you spell your last name for the record? E G G E R S. Thank you. And where are you employed? The Blount County Sheriff's Office. And what is your current position at the Blount County Sheriff's Office? Deputy Sheriff Assignment Control. And how long have you been with the Sheriff's Office? Almost five years. Have you held positions with the Sheriff's Office prior to going to patrol? Yes, sir. What are those? I worked in the jail. Uh, when did you transition from corrections to patrol? In August of 2022. And did you have to undergo uh, certain training in order to make that transition to patrol? Yes, sir. What was that? I went through the patrol academy with the post academy. And how long is that? It's uh, 13 weeks. Okay. And when did uh, when did you start that and finish that? I began, in, I believe it was August 15th of 2022. I graduated in November 4th of 2022. And just in general, not specifically, what all does the academy cover? Um, essentially everything that you need to be a post-certified police officer in the state of Tennessee. All right. Now, once you completed the academy, do they just immediately release you on patrol by yourself, or is there additional training involved? No, sir. I had to go through 14 weeks of field training with a trained field training officer. And what does that entail, just briefly? Uh, basic patrol duties, responding to calls, traffic stops, welfare checks, property checks, things of that nature. And did you successfully complete that? Yes, sir. Uh, since uh, getting out on your own patrol and completing that, have you had any additional training that you've undergone regarding, you know, your patrol activities? Yes, sir. I attend 40 hours of in-service every year. I recently completed a class called ICAT. It's essentially a uh, version of CIT, which is Crisis Intervention Training. Okay. Now, Deputy Eggers, when you're on patrol, just in general, what are your job duties and responsibilities while you're on duty? Um, I respond to call, calls for service in my assigned zone or assigned zones. Um, I do regular patrol on the streets, whether that's traffic enforcement, talking to people, things of that nature. Right. Now, are there, uh, are there different shifts uh, that you all work while on patrol here at the Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. So we have a first, second, and third shift. We work 10-hour shifts. First shift is scheduled from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Evening shift, which is my assigned shift, is scheduled from 3 p.m. to 1 a.m. And night shift comes in at 8 p.m. and stays until 6 a.m. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned you mentioned zones. What are what are zones? How does that work with patrol? So we have four zones in Blount County. Blount County is split up basically into four quadrants. Uh, one in zones one and two are the south end zones of the county, and zones three and four are the north end zones. Of and while you're on patrol, is there a, a way you all handle backup, or how, how is backup handled if you need additional officers or assistance while you're on patrol? So our supervisors make our lineup and they assign us to a specific zone or set of zones. It's different every day. I don't work the same zone every day. Um, we'll have deputies assigned to each zone, and then we'll also have a county backup north, which covers the north end, zones three and four, as I mentioned just earlier, and uh, a county backup south that covers zones one and two as I mentioned earlier. We also sometimes have county-wide backup, which will be backup for the entire county. Thank you. And if I could now please direct your attention to Thursday, February the 8th of 2024. Were you on duty on that date? Yes, sir. And I assume you were working, as you said, evening shift, second shift? Yes, sir. And did you have an assigned zone that day? Yes, sir. I was assigned to county zone three. And just in general, where is zone three? Seymour, Eagle, Dunlop, that area. Okay. And what was what was your backup situation on that night, thir uh, February the eighth? So with it being on Thursday, we had more people there than normal. Those are training days for our specialty units. 
<clears throat> so I actually had a partner sign his own breed with me, that would be Amanda Fritz. Um, we had a county back up north, and I can't recall who that was. Um, and then we had two county-wide backups who were Deputy Greg McGowan and Deputy Noel Bain. While you were on duty uh, on February the 8th, did you have reason to conduct a traffic stop on Sevierville Road? Yes, sir. And what type of vehicle was it that you stopped? It was a silver Lexus SUV. And do you know where on Sevierville Road this traffic stop occurred? It occurred in the 4900 block in between Keeble Road and Destiny Lane. And is that located in Blount County, Tennessee? Yes, sir. And do you know the approximate time of the traffic stop? Around 2000 hours or 8 p.m. 8 p.m.? And what was it that caused you to stop that vehicle? Did you observe or see anything? Yes, so I came up behind the vehicle. Um, I first observed the vehicle swerving inside its lane, so it didn't cross the double yellow or the, the fall line. It was kind of just going back and forth. Then I observed the vehicle go left of center over the double yellow line just a little bit. It did that for a moment, and then I observed the vehicle go all the way left of the center line to where the driver's side front tire was almost touching the white fault line on the opposite side of the road. And is it that at that time that you activated your emergency lights? Yes. Okay. And did the vehicle stop? Yes. Where is it that it stopped initially? In the center of its lane on the road. And is that an ideal place for a traffic stop? Yes, sir. Why is that? Um, it's not safe for me or the person I've stopped. We can get rear-ended from behind by a car. I can get hit by a car out talking to them. So it's, it's not, it's not an ideal location or safe location. So what did you do when the vehicle stopped in the middle of the road? I walked up to the driver's side window and I introduced myself to the driver as Shelby and told him that I worked for the Blount County Sheriff's Office and that I was going to ask him to pull into the driveway, which was just forward and to the left of uh, where he had stopped in the road. And did he do that initially? Sort of, he pulled up, but he pulled horizontally across the driveway that I'd asked him to pull into, stopped in the yard, and the vehicle was still partially, it was kind of sitting on the fall line, but my vehicle was still all the way in the road. So what did you do then? I reapproached the vehicle again, spoke to the driver and asked him to pull into the driveway, which was in front of the driveway that I formerly asked him to pull into and told him to pull in like he was going to the house. And did he do so? Yes. And that driveway is still located in Blount County, I believe? Yes. All right. At that point in time, did you approach the vehicle and have a more in-depth conversation with the driver? Yes. How many people were in that vehicle? Just one. Just one. And the driver of that vehicle, do you know who that was? Yes. It who? was the defendant, Kenny Dagwell. Could you please identify him here today? Yes, he's sitting in front of him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what did you do? Did you tell the defendant why you had stopped him? Yes, sir. What did you tell him? I told him, um, I, I introduced myself again, and I let him know that I'd stopped him because he was all over the roadway. All right. Now, to be fair, had you ever met uh, the defendant, Mr. Dehart, before this day? No, sir. Did you have any prior knowledge whatsoever of the defendant before this interaction? No, sir. What did the uh, defendant say in response when you told him why he had been stopped? He told me that he didn't realize that he had swerved. He was, had been pulling his hair back, and he may have swerved in that, but he was so sorry he didn't realize that he had swerved. Okay. Did you ask the defendant for his license, registration, proof of insurance, that sort of thing? Yes. And was he able to provide those? Yes. He was able to retrieve his wallet from the floor, pull his driver's license out of his wallet. Um, we were having conversations, but he continually was talking. Um, so he was distracted a bit, and it took him a moment to find the Vehicle did, did that seem at all at odd to you or indicate anything to you or anything like that? He was maybe upset or nervous about something because he was continually talking. He did not stop talking from the time that I approached the window to the time that everything happened. All right. So you took his driver's license, correct? Yes, sir. And he did, handed me the vehicle registration. All right. Did you notice anything else or sense anything else at that time that caused you concern? Um, I observed the odor of marijuana at the driver's side window. All right. So, based on that, you've got his driver's license. Where do you go from there? I go back to my vehicle so that I can check his driver's license status and see if he has any active warrants in any of the local counties. And was his license valid? His license was valid. He did not have any active warrants. All right. What do you do uh, while you're in the vehicle at this time? Um, I made a phone call to Deputy McCowan. We had already spoken back and forth over the radio, and I knew he was on his way to me. 
Um, I called him on the phone just to give him a little bit more information of what I was dealing with. I let him know that I thought that I had an impaired driver and that I was possibly going to be doing um, SFSTs or standardized field sobriety tests with the driver. So from an investigatory purpose, you're going to extend this traffic stop uh, for what reasons based on your interaction with the defendant? In order to determine whether the, the defendant was safe to operate a motor, motor vehicle on a public roadway and to search the vehicle because of the other. All right. Thank you. Did you eventually return to the vehicle and make contact with the defendant again? Yes. Now, how did you, how did you approach the vehicle this second time? The second time I made a passenger side approach, um, it gave me a bit more of a tactical advantage. My eyebrows were kind of raised based off of his, uh, just he, he seemed to be nervous. Um, so I made a passenger side approach as kind of an element of surprise. At this point, are you yelling at the defendant or anything like that? No, sir. All right. Did you tell the defendant sort of uh, what your plan was from an investigation standpoint? Yes, sir. What did you tell him? I let him know that I needed him to step out of the vehicle in order for me to search it, and I let him know also that I had probable cause to search it due to the odor of marijuana. And how did he respond to that? He was not very happy about it. He became more defiant, I guess, defensive. All right. Uh, and at this point in time, is he on the phone with anyone that you could tell? Yes, he was on the phone with, I believe, his grandmother. All right. And what, what conversation... Did you have conversation with the grandmother? I did. Originally, the grandmother and I and the defendant talked back and forth about the insurance. Um, he was searching for the proof of insurance and the insurance cards. Um, and she was the owner of the vehicle, so she was reassuring me over the phone. She did have insurance, and she must have just not put the new card in there. So we talked about that, and then I also explained to her why I needed the defendant to step out of the vehicle. And let me ask you, so was it pretty common for you to have asked Deputy McCowan to join you at this traffic stop? Was, would that be out of the ordinary at all? No, typically any time a deputy makes a traffic stop, it's not necessarily that we have to ask for backup. Somebody always, we work with each other well enough to know that if somebody makes a traffic stop, somebody is going to try to back them up. Whoever's closest will come to them just as a measure of caution. All right. So, were you able to convince the defendant to exit the vehicle voluntarily? No, sir. Did you continue to request him to do so? Yes, sir. And how did that conversation go? Um, I continued to kind of plead with him and ask him to get out of the vehicle. And I also let him know eventually, after talking to him for a few minutes, that if he did not willingly step out of the vehicle, that I was going to have to forcibly remove him from the vehicle. All right. Did uh, I mean, let me ask you this: How how big in your in your mind was the defendant? You know, what what? How would you describe him? I couldn't tell his height because he was seated in the vehicle, but probably two or three times my size. He was he's bigger guy. Yeah. Did Deputy McCowan uh, eventually arrive on scene? Yes. And where did he park? He parked his cruiser almost parallel to mine. And how did he approach the vehicle of the defendant that, where you were talking with him at? He made a driver's side approach. All right. And what did you do as Deputy McCowan approached the driver's side? Um, after Deputy McCowan began speaking with the defendant, I walked in between the defendant's car and my patrol vehicle mm -hmm. and stood next to De Deputy McCowan, sort of towards the B panel of the vehicle. And the what, what is your conversation with the defendant like at this point? I continually ask him to get out of the vehicle. I tell him this is his last chance. He's going to have to step out of the vehicle or I'm going to have to pull him out. And uh, then we open the door and I attempted to get a seat. Off. So what is your what is your first uh, plan of action regarding removing him from the vehicle? Um, I plan to go hands-on. Um, if I can use that approach, I like to. Um, so my plan was to put my arm up sort of right about here. I guess it's easy to look at something right about here so that I could hold him back from folding over the seat belt and then reach across and unbuckle him to pull him out of the vehicle. And were you able to successfully do that? No, sir. And why not? Um, he was able to grab a hold of my forearms and we just kind of tussled. So he fought you off from unbuckling him, basically? Yes. All right. So now that the uh, use of hands um, approach has failed, what is what is the next approach you, you all decide to take? Uh, Deputy McCowan draws his taser. And is there additional conversation with the defendant at this time? Yes, I informed the defendant that he did not step out of the vehicle in the case. And how did he respond to that? He was not willing to step out of the vehicle. All right. And eventually, uh, did you observe that taser being deployed? Yes. What happened when the taser was deployed? Uh, that, so, 
in the tasers that we carry, we have two sets of probes. Uh, two probes are deployed um, when the taser is fired. So, um, Deputy McCown deployed his taser, two probes were deployed, and Mr. Hart was able to pull those probes out by the wires. So, it was a, a bad contact upon initial deployment? Yes. All right. What, what occurred after the bad contact? Um, as soon as they were pulled out, uh, essentially as soon as Deputy McCowan fired the taser, the probes were pulled out by Mr. DeHart, and then um, Deputy McCowan fired his second set of probes, and they made a good contact. All right. And in conjunction with the second set of probes contacting the defendant, was the defendant doing anything? He walked up on this. Okay. And so you have a good contact. Uh, so the taser is now effective. What is what is your plan as far as extracting the defendant from the vehicle? So I still have to remove his seatbelt at some point so that I can pull him out of the vehicle. So what did you do? So um, while the taser was being deployed and he was incapacitated, uh, I forgot to add that I believe Mr. DeHart shut the door after the first bad contact with the taser. The door was shut. Um, when I went in, I still had to get a seatbelt off, get him out, so I opened the door while the taser was being deployed, um, reached in to grab the seatbelt, and I got wrapped up in the wire, so I got a taser as well, and I was fully incapacitated. So you were feeling the effects of the taser as well as Mr. Dehart? Yes. All right. Once, uh, how long does a taser typically go for? Five seconds. All right. Once that five seconds was up, what did you do? Um, I stepped away from the vehicle to kind of gather my composure and catch my breath. Um, and Deputy McCowan continued to deal with the defendant. All right. Did Deputy McCowan eventually reposition himself? As soon as I stepped back from the vehicle, Deputy McCowan repositioned himself to where he was sort of standing diagonally facing the defendant. His, uh, his body was sort of next to the driver's side mirror. And did something occur at that point in time? Yes. What, what was that? I was shot and so was Deputy McCowan. Did you see what had happened? I was on the ground. All, all I heard was the gunshots. I didn't ever see the gun being pulled out. All right. Um, do you know where were you shot? In the leg. And what was what was going through your mind at this time? Um, I didn't know where I had been shot in the leg. I just felt pain in my right thigh. I knew it was somewhere in my thigh. Um, I fell to the ground immediately, and everything kind of moved slow motion. Um, I couldn't get myself up, and I thought, I, I took a breath, and I accepted death because I thought he was going to fire at me again. And he, he, had, he had an advantage over me. He could have shot me in the back of the head. I thought he was going to kill me. Were you uh, eventually able to get back on your feet? Yes. Uh, uh, where was the defendant when you were doing this? He was still in the driver's side. Once you got back on your feet, where did you go? Uh, I ran behind Deputy McCowan's car and drew my service weapon. All right. Is he still? Um, is he still the car motionless at this point, or has he started to move? Uh, I believe he had started to move when I was at the back of the vehicle pulling my gun out, and he drove around the tree in the yard and drove through the yard to, to exit. All right, and what did you do as he as he's pulling around? Is he driving back towards you at this point? He wasn't driving. Well, he was. Driving back towards my direction, but not at me. Okay. Um, he was driving back towards Silver Road, going towards, kind of diagonally towards Silver Road, and ended up turning right to go back towards Maryville. But what did you do as he was passing you? Um, I moved up to the front of Deputy McCowan's vehicle so I could have a good vantage point. I fired three rounds from my service weapon, and um, he turned right on the Silver Road, the way we were facing. Um, he turned right on the Sevierville Road, and I still had my gun out, but I knew that I couldn't shoot anymore because I had a line of cars, and I didn't know that I was in any more danger. So you fired the three as he's heading towards Sevierville Road, but chose not to, to shoot additional rounds because there's, there's tra other traffic there, basically. Right. All right. Uh, Deputy, was your cruiser equipped with a dash cam video? Yes. And were you likewise equipped with a body-worn camera? Yes. And do you know if Deputy McCowan's cruiser was equipped with a dash cam video? Yes. And do you know if he was equipped with a body-worn camera? Yes. And have you previously reviewed all four of those videos? Yes, sir. And do those videos fairly and accurately represent the events that occurred that night? Yes, sir. Karen, at this time I'm going to ask to play those videos. Your Honor, I'm going to ask to play those videos. 
Your Honor, I would ask that this collection of videos be entered as exhibit number four, please. Uh, Deputy Eggers, how many times were you shot? And how many uh, exit wounds did you have from that shot? I have uh, three wounds. I have an entrance wound down towards my right knee and two exit wounds on, my, on the outside of my upper uh, right thigh. Deputy Eggers, thank you. Pass the witness. Thank you. I'm Matt Garner of the Public Defender's Office. Mr. Elrod and I have been appointed to represent Mr. DeHart. Uh, I know these are disturbing questions. I, I'm simply trying to find out the details of various things that happened. Uh, some of my questions may seem a little foolish, but I'm legally blind and I can't always tell from the films what happened and I can't drive so some of these questions relate to that. Uh, where were you headed that night on Sevierville Road? Um, I was headed back towards town. It was actually close to um, even just dinner break so I was going to do something to So you were just on a routine patrol? Yes sir. What brought your attention to the vehicle that Mr. DeHart was driving? The way he was driving. Can you describe it for us please? Yes, so um, the video is the best example, but um, I witnessed the vehicle swerving within its lane, and then I witnessed the vehicle go left of center just a little bit, and then after a few minutes of it going back and forth doing that, I witnessed the vehicle go all the way to the opposite side of the road where the driver's side tire was close to the fog line on the opposite side of the road. Was there other traffic around at that time? Yes, sir, there were cars coming in the opposite direction. So, was his driving endangering other people, in your opinion, or not? Yes, sir. I take it you have been trained in uh, stops for, for driving under the influence? Yes, sir. Can you tell us some of the signs of a person's driving that indicates he might be driving under the influence? Um, going slower than usual, maybe under the speed limit, um, not being able to maintain their length. Uh, so, at that point, you decided to stop this vehicle. Yes, sir. Why? Because of him going left of center. Okay. At that point, did you you think he might be intoxicated, or were you simply worried that he was endangering other drivers and violating the law? Both. Okay. So, when you came up to him. We could see it on the video, but one thing we can't tell is you said on the video more than once that you smelled marijuana coming from somewhere in the vehicle. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Could you tell if that smell aroma was coming from Mr. DeHard or simply the vehicle in general? No, sir. Just, it, it could have been from Mr. DeHard or the vehicle in general. But you, you didn't know? But how strong was the odor? Strong enough for me to notice it. You've already testified that you have been trained in, in DUI arrests. What signs on a person are there that they've been intoxicated? Um, you can tell a lot by the eyes most of the time. Um, I could not tell very much from Mr. DeHart's eyes. Um, to be honest, I wasn't focused on his eyes, I was focused on his hands, his movements, things of that nature. Um, but their behavior, the way they act, the way they speak, um, sometimes if they're under the influence of some type of depressant, they're going to speak slower, have slurred speech. Um, however, Mr. DeHart seemed very excited. Um, he seemed nervous about something um, and was immediately pretty defensive. So you couldn't tell anything from his eyes? And you couldn't tell anything from his complexion, obviously. And that's, that's one of the things you look at, isn't it? His complexion? Yeah. I'm, if, if, maybe if his cheeks are flushed? If it's flushed, but you can't tell Mr. DeHart because he's so dark, I take it. Uh, you'd never seen Mr. DeHart before? No, so I take it you couldn't tell one way or the other if his speech was slurred? No, 
at what point during that video did you decide that he was probably under the influence? Um, as soon as, not the first contact that I had with him, but after we got the vehicle's positioned safely, um, when I began to talk to him, I thought that he may be impaired. Just, just off of the way he was acting, he was very erratic, very excited about something. Okay, so based upon the smell of marijuana, the erratic driving, and the nervous, excited way that he was behaving, you thought at that point he might be under the influence. Yes, sir. Now, what is the the regular thing that you do when you determine a driver's under the influence? Um, I try to talk to them, ask them, you know, where they've been, where they're coming from, if they've had anything to drink, any impairing drugs, anything like that. I want like to be straightforward about that because a lot of times people will be honest. Um, another thing is uh, pulling the person out of the car to perform standardized field sobriety tests. Did you form an opinion as to whether Mr. DeHart was being honest with you when, when you were talking with him when he was inside the car? No. And I did, didn't have an opinion of whether he was being honest with me or not. But you did think he might be under the influence? Yes, sir. So it was your intention that he get out of the car so that he undergo like the one leg stand and the walk and turn and those standardized field sobriety tests? Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. And he refused to do that? Yes, sir. It looked like that you continued to interact with Mr. DeHart for what, four or five minutes maybe until Officer McGowan arrived? Yes. Now, can you explain to me how a taser works, what it is, and, and how you operate it and what it does? So the simplest explanation I can give you is um, the, there are probes. There are two probes fired out the end of the taser. Those probes make contact with wherever they hit on your body with the heart. It was <clears throat> chest, stomach area. Um, and those... <clears throat> There are wires connected to those probes that send electric signals through the wires into the person's body. And it has different effects on some people than others. For me, personally, it completely incapacitates me. It incapacitates me and it hurts. Um, it hurts. It feels like your muscles are trying to jump out of your body is the way that I would describe it. So, <clears throat> basically, it, it's a gun-like thing that shoots these wires with the probes on the end. Yes, it's a less, less lethal device. All right. And... If I could tell right from the video, that was used twice? Three times. Three times. All right. What happened after the first use of the taser? So when the taser probes were, when the first set of probes was fired from Deputy McCowan's taser, Mr. DeHart was able to grab the wires and pull the wires out, so it did not have an effect on him. However, Deputy McCowan fired his second set of probes from his taser, which made contact with him and successfully incapacitated Mr. DeHart. And Mr. DeHart was wearing a seatbelt, correct? Yes. So you couldn't just pull him out without having to undo the belt? Correct. Okay. So uh, what happened after the third deployment of the taser? So during the second deployment of the taser, um, I attempted to get inside the car and take Mr. DeHart's seatbelt off of him so that I could pull him out while he was incapacitated so he wouldn't be fighting against me. Um, and I got wrapped, my arm got wrapped up in the taser wire, and so I was as well incapacitated. All right, so the, the taser had to be deployed again? Yes. All right. After you got incapacitated, if I understood your testimony correctly, you went from the side of Mr. DeHart's car over to Deputy McGowan's car. Is that right? I was sort of, I was facing, I was right next to Mr. DeHart, like my legs would be touching, I was right in front of him. And once the five second cycle of the taser was over, the, the one where I was incapacitated as well, I took a step back and I stepped sort of behind Deputy McGowan. He was standing facing the driver, and he repositioned himself to where he was facing the driver diagonally, and his body would sort of be in line with the driver's side mirror. So he was kind of in front of Mr. McCowan toward the front of the car beside the mirror? Yes. Is that Mr. right? Mr. DeHart was still in the vehicle. Okay, and where were you at that point? I was um, 
I would say in line with the B pillar, but I'd step back a couple of feet because I stepped back to gain, regain my composure so that I could get back in. And so you would have been what, eight or ten feet away, maybe, or something like that. Probably not even that far, maybe four to five. I don't <coughs> I understand you're just making an estimate, and this happened very fast. And did you see Mr. DeHart pull his gun out? No, sir. I heard the gunshots, and I was immediately on the ground. Uh, so you don't know? You had not seen the gun before. No. And I you don't know where? The gun in the you didn't know where it came from. No, it, it came from inside the vehicle, but I don't know where in the vehicle. Came from. Do you know what, how many shots were fired? I, I heard several in a very short period of time. It sounded like three. Does that sound right to you, or, or is that not right? I believe it was five. Okay. Do you know which shot hit you? The first one. The very first shot, right? Do you know which shot hit Deputy McGowan, or were you able to see? I was not able. So, I mean, I take it, a, a shot like that, if it hits you in the knee, you, you just fall down totally unable to can't see anything else, basically. Is that right? Yeah. When I got hit, my body kind of turned to where my back was facing the vehicle, so I, I kind of turned and fell through. So, my, my back was to everything happening. I, I, I guess it's been a year or two ago, I fell and tore up the tendon in my knee, and I just remember being on the ground and not able to see or think about much of anything except what had happened to me. So did, did you actually see much of anything happen from then on? I heard everything happening. I was eventually able to gain my composure, get back on my feet, and uh, do as I was trying to do. Um, I could not see everything happening behind me. I got a ready behind Deputy McCallum's vehicle, and then I was able to see everything. But and at, at that point, off Deputy McGowan was on the ground. Yes. Uh, so, you you talked to your partner. Was your partner still in the car during all this? Uh -huh. Then didn't you say you were riding with somebody? No. When I was saying my partner in the video, I was referring to Deputy McGowan. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sir. sorry. Uh, so you called dispatch and they sent someone and see. For what it's worth, Deputy, I'd know for the questions, but I thought you handled a difficult situation very well. No redirect no redirector on it. Step down back outside.